we're going to replace you with AI. Now, what I want you to do is show everybody how to use AI correctly so we can then fire you. <laughs> do you really think somebody's going to show you how to make themselves unemployed? I want to start really by talking about, you know, you went to Japan, you had a host host family, you've traveled, you, I think you said you have a wife from the Philippines, you tend to have lots of exposure to different cultures and travel. How did that get started? At what age did that start for you? Well, you know, back in probably the 80s or something like that, that's when the Japan fad hit the United States, you know, and you had all these uh, TV shows, completely fictitious, outlandish, fictional outlandish stuff. You know, about samurai, about ninjas, about all this stuff. I'm like, wow, that's really different. So when I went to Michigan State University, I uh, enrolled in Asian studies. And it's like, wow, okay, this is completely different than anything I've ever seen. You know, I mean, at that point in my life, you know, the architecture and, and everything else. So it really interested me. And I talked to my mom and dad. I said, you know, uh, given how Japan and everybody's writing about the Japanese miracle and the Japanese economy, you know, which was very prevalent in, in literature and culture at that time. I said, I, I think it'd be good if I go and study in Japan. So I applied and I went there and um, it was fascinating. You know, and some of the things also is that it causes you to question or to realize stuff that you hadn't really necessarily understood or thought about when you're in your own culture. So it, it gave me a really good chance. And then uh, the other thing is my, my host family was fantastic. You know, it really cool. And my uh, host father, um, he was, uh, worked for uh, Nepal life insurance and he had a number of big corporate clients. And I was very interested in going and talking to these clients about what they did with technology and how they, uh, brought people up to speed and quality and whatever, and kind of just, just unfocused all over the place. Cause it's not like I was one of those guys who said, Oh, you know what? I want to do this, Joel. Yeah, no, I like, well, I think I want to, nah, I don't know where I want to go. So I, I went and I had a chance to talk to these companies and see what they're doing and stuff like that. And a lot of that that stuff that I saw, it just kind of sat in the back and, and germinated along with everything else and my undergrad degree and, and what have you and started kind of combining the IT and the the, the interest in people and culture and, and business. It just kind of all started coming together, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. And what was your first real gig? Um. Okay. So... Out of college, um, George needed a degree. Now, this was, uh, let's see, when did I graduate? 90, all right? And at that time, I had two job offers, one with AT&T, one with IBM. And for my graduation gift, my parents uh, said, okay, we'll fund you to go back to Japan and uh, see your host family and also go down and see some friends in Singapore. So I did that and I came back and, you know, this is right in the middle of really bad economic times. Both job offers had been rescinded. So my first real job out of college was working for Radio Shack, trying to sell computers when they were a very closed, very overpriced, whatever architecture and trying to tell them that the reason it wasn't selling this because it was a horrible architecture just didn't, didn't work. But um, from there, though, I went in and I worked for a printing company. And the cool thing is when you're in a two-person IT shop that's growing rapidly, you got your fingers in everything, programming, pulling cable through the ceiling wiring stuff up. The joke was if it had a power cord in it, we were responsible for it. So I, I got exposed to a lot of different things I would feel very fortunate to, uh, very fortunate for. I also had a boss, Jonathan Fisk, who's probably one of the most patient guys on the planet because he tolerated me and my antics and would be like, okay, George, let's go ahead. All right, now come over here and, and do this instead. All right. And uh, it was it was very cool. So that's where I kind of started out my my corporate IT gig, if you will. Nice. I like it. Everything with a power cord, like you're a chief electron officer. <laughs> oh, dude, I had to take apart, we know those big, oh, I don't know if you've ever seen them in, in offices, they have these big giant industrial shredders. Well, mm -hmm. ours would jam. It's like, okay, do we pay a technician to come out? No, George has screwdrivers. All right, we'll go and get George. And so I had this big industrial shredder all set apart going in to find out where one of those big binder clips had gone in and jammed something. You know, I take it all apart, lube it, put it back together and whatever, but all kinds of fun stories like that that you might not have encountered if you'd worked for a big siloed, you know, IT organization. But yeah, anything with power cord. I'm glad you're open and we're talking about this, like 
diverse experience set that you, that you like and the way you speak about it, you're proud of it and you're aware of it. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that wish they could be open about it versus, you know, jobs typically want you to be like very narrow and focused and specific. Uh, but it seems like you've realized it was a superpower. You embraced it and leveraged it. Tell me more about that. So you have this awareness of yourself that you like these different things. How did you weave that into a career? Okay. So part of it, um, it's just my personality. Um, I'm notoriously nonlinear inside a gardener. You know, if you think about the movie Up, you know, where the dog sees a squirrel, it's like squirrel and everything like stops. That's me, you know. So, um, you know, I, I'm just intrigued by many different things. And I, I've been lucky because I've, I've had a number of different careers that allowed me to like build on different building blocks. So when I'd look at a career, I'd look at both number one, cultural fit. Number two, what can I learn? All right. And if it wasn't something that I was going to learn something at, I'd be like, well, I don't know if this is really a good idea. So I had a lot of jobs where I learned things. Sometimes there were good things. Sometimes there were bad things. Sometimes in hindsight, where I looked at it and said, wow, I, I, I should never have done that. All right. And you, you really have to always take a step back and look at it and, and ask yourself what I'd call the four what's. Okay. What worked? What didn't work? What should I do next time? What shouldn't I do next time? And apply that to, to what it is that you're doing and, and just keep broadening yourself out. If you allow an employer to dictate your career path, I think that's, that's going to be kind of your, your, your demise. I think you have to say, all right, what do I want to be when I grow up? Now, bear in mind, I'm turning 56. I don't know. <laughs> I thought I was going to be a gardener like two years, maybe three years max, get gardener on my resume and be, hey, hasta la vista, baby. But instead, I'm still here 13 years later because I work with some really cool people. And I get to talk to folks like yourselves and Josh and, and CIOs, CTOs all over the place. I get to hear stories of what worked, what didn't work, whatever. And I'm still here because it's a really cool job. So coming back around, I think the the burden is on your shoulders to say, okay, I don't want to be one and only one thing. I want to explore. I want to whatever. And then figure out how you're going to do that, both formally and informally. Some of it may be on your employer's time. Some of it might be on your off hours. Like um, I started, uh, well, I started, stopped, failed a few times, uh, software businesses where, you know, I was writing software like out of the, out of the, 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 the study, right? You know, and all kinds of weird stuff, you know, whatever would interest me, I'd write it, I'd throw it out there and see what happened. But that taught me a lot about coding and about business, et cetera. But my point is, it's, it's on your shoulders. Don't let an employer dictate to you or limit you. You need to think about, okay, what interests me? And just keep building it. If you go down a path and you're like, I don't like this path, then, then choose another one. But you just keep trying. You just keep learning. When you stop learning, you're, you're in a world of hurt. Any, any thoughts or, or comments on that, Joel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum of somebody who who they, they do this naturally, right? They bounce around a lot. So if we take one extreme and say someone who's bouncing around so much, let's use my sister, uh, <laughs> my sister. Shout out to Joel's sister. Week, sorry. Sh shout out to her. Every week she's expressing like her new found love thing she's going to do with her life right and she doesn't stay with anything it's like photography and music it's like just keeps going and it, and she never sticks with anything and she's you know a talented person right anything she touches she's very really creative and but she just never sticks with something long enough for it to mature to anything we saw this happening when she was 18 she's 33 ish now and it hasn't stopped and she just never, she gets an inch deep and in a, in a mile wide. If you're one of those types of people, uh, how do you develop the discipline or the focus to, you know, at least pick your project, but then see it through? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess this is something where you have to, again, ask yourself, you know, what is it do, that I want to do? Um, one of the things I tell my nephews and nieces is, you know, don't let a job define who you are. A job is what you do to make the money that you need to do what you want to do. So I, I tell your niece, look, you got to settle on something, you know, give it a year, give it two years, whatever it may be, but view it as a way to get the money to fund the stuff you do outside of work. You want to dabble in all kinds of things? Awesome. Rock on. But you need to have that job. You need to have that money coming in and you're going to have trouble. 
And we all know that if an employer sees you jumping job to job to job to job, that's a big warning flag for the employer. You know, if they're seeing it like, you know, I, I think they say less than a year or something like that person is going from job to job, that's a red flag. So I'd, I'd tell her, I said, look, find something, view it as a way to make the money that you want to, to, to fund what it is that you want to do outside of work. Give it a go, give it at least a year and then move on from there. But some people just aren't wired that way, unfortunately. And I like what you said about the year thing. That's actually one of the very first disqualifiers we have on applicants. We're, we're less than 20 people. We're not a big company. But when we look for sales or whatever position, if the, there are that, I'd say half the resumes maybe are people staying no longer than a year and a month or a year and two months or something of that nature. And for me, you know, being an entrepreneur and like I, it takes a year to come in and get your projects and really understand what's happening at the business. And then in your second year, you can not only do the job that you're paid for, but you can figure out how to do more to like push the business forward farther because you've got your core excuse for a paycheck down and then you can grow the business farther. So yeah, that's what we definitely look for. And I'm unapologetic and about it because they will stay a year. If, if you if you keep hiring those people, get, they're not going to break their pattern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know what's really interesting is um, when I got interviewed by Gardner, uh, first off, one of the recruiters reached out to me way back when and said, so I see you can write. Yeah. You ever heard of Gardner? Well, yeah. You ever thought about working at Gardner? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, but what was interesting was it, it took several months before I was hired. And I talked to all these different people. And Joe B- uh, Baylock, who was the vice president over everything at the time or whatever the, the title was, Joe is a very smart guy. I respected him. Uh, he's interviewing me and he's kind of pushing, you know, on areas that I, I had a hard time remembering to look to see if I get frazzled and stuff. But he asked, so what do you think about Gartner so far? I said, well, you folks uh, sure take a long time to hire somebody. And he didn't miss a beat, Joel. He goes, well, we want to make sure we hire the right people. All right. Now I have no problem talking. I shut up at high speeds because he was absolutely right. You know, you look at whatever business we're doing, it's built on people. Having the right people is extremely important, okay? I, I think sometimes we get caught up in looking at the technical skills alone and we don't judge the, the whole package enough. If you're trying to build a high-performing team, you need people who can work on a team. You need people who are smart, who are trustworthy, who are motivated, who are self-starters. You know, if you're having to handhold them constantly, and I always call them the followers. You leave the room, all work stops. You enter the room, all work stops. Starts. You know, <laughs> you leave the room, all work stops. You you need you you can't afford people like that. You you need to make sure you hire the right people. And I think sometimes we're in such a rush that we just go down the technical checklist of okay, what are your skills, but we don't think about that fit, and it's so critical. And then what do you? What's your specific role at Gartner? Sure. I'm, I'm a, a VP analyst in Gartner, which means I talk to people and I share stories. Um, now, what it is, is I'm in the IT leaders group. We have, we have different groups in Gartner. We have a peer practitioner who goes out and designing craft studies that they're going to do. And then they name the companies that they're working with and what they found out as part of the study. We have IT leaders, which is my group, which is looking at uh, strategies and trends that are going on in, in, in the industry and whatnot. And then we also have, like, for example, Gardner for Technology Professionals is really getting down at the practitioner level. And these folks are just so smart. You know, whenever I talk to them, you know, in terms of how to bring it all together. Then we also have groups like consulting events. uh, We have advisors. But uh, in the ITL role, I have this chance to talk to all these different people about what they're doing. And again, what works, what doesn't work. And, And what keeps me awake at night is how do we get people to learn? How do we get people to change? And when I talk to organizations these days, talk to leaders, their big concerns also revolve around this, along with, hey, how do we get the right people? How do we upskill them? What do we need to do? The, the technology can be challenging at times, but it's a, the people part that can be really hard. And not to beat the AI horse to death, because obviously it comes up a lot, but you have a fairly unique perspective because... A lot of times I'm interviewing people that are like, you know, the head technology person at their company, but you get to interact with a lot of different uh, tech leaders and you get to talk about the future a lot. So I think it's valuable to hear from you. So obviously people's always a hard thing, right? We're making these tools that are compressing time, making, you know, what used to take a week, take a day. 
Uh, how what, What's the impact of that if you extend that out like infinitely? Boy, that's a, like the hardest question you've thrown at me. Um, <laughs> the short answer is nobody really knows. You know, I mean, for the longest time, AI languished in the land of sci-fi. You know, we'd see these things like HAL 9000 or we'd see the robots in Star Wars or whatever. And it's like, oh, wow, it's amazing. But we were so far off from it. You're still to the point now where you're getting... I guess I'd call them gists or informed answers back, uh, you know, in terms of things when you're looking at the generative AI. But when you start looking at things where the sheer volume of data and the speed and the complexity exceed what a person can crunch, for me, that's where things get really interesting really fast. Uh, one of our clients is a big payment processor. They're generating 1.4 petabytes a day of operational log data. Now, I'm old enough to remember when a petabyte was a theoretical number. You know, it's like, okay, kilo, mega, mega, giga, you know, tera. What comes next? Peta, ooh, you know, and everybody got like all excited. But here we are, a group generating that much data uh, each day just of operation stuff. All right. The day in the past of somebody going through a, a log file line by line manually to find something is gone. All right. You don't have the time. You, you, there's just way too much data. So using the the machine learning, the AI capabilities to make better use of that data to predict what we need to do to understand the risk, uh, to say, all right, what are the impacts going to be if we put something out there? Or for example, to understand, um, you know, uh, we've got incidents going on, what, what might be causing them, making recommendations. There, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on. Now, I was hearing a thing the other day, and it, it kind of gave me a pause to think. When you have something that's very repetitive and you can, you can go after it, you know, it's, it's very straightforward for AI right now. But where you have stuff that's high touch, all right, meaning there's a lot of human element to it, at this point, there's nothing that, that's quite touching it. So right now, I'm, I'm jaded. I'm a skeptic. I've got more gray hair than what you can see in the camera. For those of you who don't know, Joel can see me in a camera right now. We've got but, an AI um, filter on him. He's got Yeah, he's got AI filter. Hair. Oh, <laughs> Joel, you don't look anything like what I thought. <laughs> um, but uh, you, uh, you take all that AI washing away. I mean, cause people are putting AI on everything, you know, and we've seen this before. I, I've been in the industry long enough that, you know, oh, Hey, you know, we'll put ITSM or Idle on it. It'll it'll solve world peace. People will buy our software, our consulting services, or whatever. Oh, we'll put DevOps on it. It'll they'll buy our software. They'll they'll do our consulting services or whatever. Uh, cloud. Oh my God, solves world peace. And, and now here we are at AI. Oh, it'll solve world peace. It'll do this. It'll do that. It'll do another thing. I look at. It, I'm like, well, okay. There's some really interesting things coming out of it. There will continue to be some really interesting things coming out of it. But like any other tool, there are going to be use cases where it makes sense and use cases where it doesn't. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think time will tell how much we can really mimic the human condition and, and have the empathy and stuff like that. that. That's not there. But crunching massive amounts of data and, and trying to make better use of it and improving the interactions between systems and, and whatever, for me, that's pretty intriguing. And like every day, I... I we have these groups in Gardner, you know, they're always posting, you know, what's going on with AI and what are they hearing about? What are they seeing, et cetera. And the evolution is stunning. Some of it's complete mm. baloney. You just know it's smoke, mirrors, mm. and PowerPoint. And then, you know, some of it's real and it's, it's amazing, you know. So we'll, we'll see. Time will tell what it, what it can actually pull off. But I think, at least speaking as an analyst, I probably got a few more years left in the gig before I have to worry about it too much. Oh, I 100% agree. Like it takes, if you go back, I'll back up. I was very surprised on this show when I was talking to people that still have mainframes. Like that, that mainframes are still a, a huge, a huge deal. And they have the, these old technologies. I remember I had one conversation about five years ago where uh, I think we edited out the name of it, but it was a power plant who had software that no one was alive that knew how to operate it. So they had to hire these this company to come in and reverse engineer the power plant software so that they could provide, you know, the electrical services to people. Um, so, yeah, I've actually that, kind of that's forgot. That's not an unusual story, Joel, <laughs> <laughs> of people and AI and, and 
learning and change and and what have you. And you're telling me about the the old stuff, mainframes. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's it takes a long time. Thank you for helping me get back there. It takes a long time to once technology exists for it to just permeate throughout humanity. So to your point, you have. I'm sure you have many years left as an analyst, right? Because while this technology today, you could say, act like, you know, Freud and it will counsel you in the tone of Freud, right? With those principles that are written in those books and it can mimic these things and do these things. But that through business and refinement and application and deployment to society to not only be deployed to society, but become a norm within society, that takes human time for it to disseminate throughout us and conversations and all of that. Uh, so I don't think it's like a immediate thing at the same time. It is change that is likely going to accelerate faster than any of the previous change because like, have you used mid journey? How much, how many hours have you logged on mid journey? If any, my, my daughter renders me all kinds of cool stuff out of mid journey. I have an account there and yeah. some of the stuff is just stunning. It's, yeah. Have you ever used it in the line of work, like trying to create Facebook posts or assets? Wow. I'll tell you what, like it, we use GPT. GPT saves us about a hundred grand a year, just in man hours of, uh, cause we make our show, but we make about 20 other shows for other companies. Like we produce other podcasts. We do all the prep and interviews and questions and everything. So we have a Slack channel dedicated to how to use GPT to do this. And we have one resident expert you know, who helps teach the other producers all the tips and tricks and we share knowledge. But GPT has had a huge influence in our business in the past seven months. It's made it easier, easier for us to scale. And then we just started integrating in the past couple of weeks mid journey. And so before we would have signer, have design meeting, talk about what we want in the ad and do all of this, we've boiled that down to a, the marketing director, not even needing to talk to a designer just issuing a several commands to mid journey and getting it 90% of the way there. And then we just go to the designer and be like, Hey, can you just touch this up? It's, 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 it's so fast. You could literally say that it could cut half of the designers, the need for half of the designers out today, but that's not happened today because it's going to take time for me to talk about that. It's going to take time for people to share. It's going to take time for those tools to get better and people to build tools on top of mid journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you look at it, you, the marketing adoption curve is live and well. You know, that's the one that said, okay, you've got the innovators who see something and, and they grab onto it really easy. Like yourself, they, they see what these things are capable of. They don't need somebody to explain to them the value. They don't need to see somebody else, what they did, et cetera. They understand the value and they jump right on it. Now, after the, the innovators, you get the early adopters. The early adopters are just kind of waiting to see if the innovators get the promised value from it, a little bit more conservative, and then they jump as well. Then when you start getting into the early majority, and this is where I kind of use the, the product adoption curve to parallel adoption inside an organization. These people, I notice, need two things. Okay, so you've crossed the chasm. All right, if you want to get out the product adoption curve, make sure I'm doing the labels right. I, I never know for sure. Um, but uh, you get into the early majority, and these people need somebody to sit down and explain to them the value. You know, like they hear mid-journey AI and they're like, oh, uh, isn't that something that does kind of like weird things for kids, you know, or something like that. And they, they're not thinking about how they could use it like in a marketing situation. Or they might not be going, oh, you know what? Why don't we go to chat GPT and ask it to give us some structured question about uh, somebody for their cloud strategy or for their whatever, and then get out, you know, this formulaic answer about what our, our, a strategy should entail or what are the questions are that you can ask. Um, but uh, they need somebody to explain it to them. Now, here's the catch. All right. So number one, we have them saying, all right, you have to talk to them in terms that they understand. Number two, they need to see the value. They need you to not just talk to them about something theoretically, but they need you to actually show it to them. And they need you ideally to show somebody else that's doing it and is getting value from it. So when you're watching the introduction of technology into an organization, it doesn't happen overnight. We actually will say big bang is equals big mess. There's too many variables. There's a really, really interesting guy, at least I think he is, at University of Michigan, Dr. And he said, you know, if Toyota's so great and so much has been written about Toyota, how come so few people can replicate Toyota? 
everybody said, wow, that's a great answer. I said, wow, that's a, or a great question. I thought to myself, wow, that's a great question. Because uh, there is tons of books out there. I mean, even when I was going to Japan and stuff like that, there are all these books about Toyota and all this stuff. Well, what he found out was that the role of a leader in Toyota isn't to tell people what to do. It's to coach them through continual improvement. And the kata that he said, uh, the, this four-step kata that he identified, a kata is a Japanese martial arts pattern, okay? It's something that you do repetitively to learn how to block, do, you know, strike, whatever it may be against an imaginary opponent or opponents, plural. So he said, all right, you're given a direction and you have to grasp the current condition. Now, that's a really interesting way of wording things, grasp the current condition. You don't always know the current state perfectly, all right? And then, uh, you know, we, we in historically, what would we do? Oh, let's get in a room and have a group hug. We're going to envision the future state. And, and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. And there's a bajillion variables we know nothing about, but we're going to imagine the future. And then what do we do? Oh, we're going to come up with a project plan and close the curve or close the gap, right? Well, okay, unknowns, unknowns. You're going to close the gap and you're in a complex adaptive system that while you're fiddling with it is changing. No, no, Spanky, you're not going to change, all right? And a lot of these transformation efforts fail. So instead, you have to look at it and you have to iterate through. And I, I and where I'm going with this whole story is I think when groups look at adopting technology and they look at, at how they go about doing change, they're fundamentally going about it in a wrong way because they don't adopt these concepts like AI overnight, okay? You have to instead start small, focused, you have to learn, you have to improve, and you have to show the value. Because the, the ratchet there is value. People have to understand and see the value. You know, if I keep promising you something's going to solve world peace and I never deliver, you're a smart man, very senior. You're like, George, you talk a great talk, but you have nothing to show here. All right, I'm, I'm on to the next thing. That's the way life is. That's the way business is. But if I can show you the value and you look at it and you say, wow, the value of George's idea, concept, thing, whiz bang, AI, you name it, justifies the cost and risk that I, Joel, am going to encounter, and it's going to happen in the timeframes that I require, what's going to happen? You're going to want it. You're going to pull it in. All right? So when you're deploying these technologies, you know, we, we have this tendency to want to go all in and go big bang, but there's just too many variables. We need to instead start small, focus, learn, improve, and show the value and grow our footprint. Um, can a big bang change work? Yeah, it's just riskier than I prefer. If I would really like to help an organization learn, improve, and change, I'd take more of an iterative adoption approach. You know, there's an awful lot of lessons we can learn from history with the introduction of automation, of robots, of whatever, that we could take and say, all right, let's not be them and apply that to AI as well. Last, last comment. You know, let's say you're a graphics designer and I say, you know what, we're going to replace you with AI. Now, what I want you to do is show everybody how to use AI correctly so we can then fire you. <laughs> do you really think somebody's going to show you how to make themselves unemployed? But we do this kind of nonsense all the time, you know, and I think instead if we were saying, all right, how could we use AI in a very intelligent manner that will allow us to scale faster? with the people that we have so that we can all have better and better outcomes. I think that's a heck of a lot better message than, oh, so if I get your AI tool, how many people can I fire? I, you know, it's it's just a, a screwed up recipe, but it's one we go after a lot. So I warn you, I'm nonlinear. No, I love it, man. Uh, to your point, we'll we'll jump around. My wife and I use squirreling as a verb. So I'll be like, am I squirreling right now? She's like, yeah, you're squirreling. I'll be like, all right, cool. Typically, it involves me taking on new projects because I'll just, I get real excited to take on new projects and then I have to just cut them all off and be like, no, I got to focus on like the two or three that are going to really change everything. Um, but yeah, you were talking about focus, change, value, and pushing that through organizations uh, and a lot of people getting it wrong, right? And you gave the example, you made it super clear, the process, but I want you to bring it home a little bit deeper with a more concrete example. So like, do you have a concrete example of a transformation that was successful that started with a small focus, they tracked the value and, and went through that whole curve? Yeah. Well, if you look at a lot of agile transformations, they take an agile approach. All right. So look at agile development, look at DevOps, et cetera. 
The groups who go in and say, okay, we're going to iterate our deployment of Agile, of DevOps, they're going to have a lot better success than an organization who comes in, all right, we're going to put together a good team of people, which you can absolutely do. We're going to have them learn everything there is to know about Agile, about DevOps, about fill in the blank. And then we're going to take and uh, cookie cutter this out to everybody with all the variables that we're talking about, et cetera. So all you need to do is to look at the groups that are successfully adopting Agile. Um, and not just one or two, but I mean, they're, they're actually going about it. They're, they started small, focused, and they grew their footprint. Um, I'm always really bad with names. All right, I'll, I'll be very honest about it. Um, so thinking of a company right off the top of my head, I, I'm just drawing okay. a blank. But th th those would be a good example. Now, let's, let's just dovetail to one interesting segue. Look at open source, all right? Fill in the blank any open source effort you like, all right? Wh whatever your favorite one is. Somebody comes up with a vision. What does that vision represent? Value. What does that value do? It attracts people, early like collaborators. Then what can they do? Well, then they can crank out some code. They can get some stuff done. What are they doing? They're demonstrating value. All the while along, they're learning more about what is needed, what they need to do, et cetera. All right. And they course correct. All right. This is classic agile. All right. Now, along the line, they're improving their vision. They're improving their deliverables. They're getting more stuff out there. What's that doing? It's attracting more uh, users. It's attracting more collaborators. So what can they do? Well, again, they can get more work done. They can refine and expand their vision. So these giant open source efforts that are out there, again, fill in the blank of anyone you like, they didn't show up on the scene at scale overnight. They showed up very small, very focused. And the group started, they learned, they improved, they showed the value, and it grew through the attraction of value. So I, I think that's uh, maybe an example where I can say broad brush. You look at most of those big efforts, they didn't just magically appear overnight. But uh, look at Agile, look at DevOps. Those are very good examples. If, if you hop up on YouTube, there's tons of videos, tons of case studies. Uh, Dr. Rother has a lot of stuff up there about the use of his kata, et cetera. So sorry, Joel, it's just me and my limitations. Oh, no worries at all. Uh, again, I'm very limited. We got editors and they make us sound brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Dude, Josh promised me the AI made me sound smart, so I'm really hoping. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, I'll tell you, I was definitely on the DevOps didn't deliver the promise. Everyone slaps the label on train. And, and, and I think that GPT and MidJourney are the first two things which they're kind of the same thing, but first two things that have delivered on the hype that I imagined would exist as a person who has built technology for you know 20 years. And I was actually very, very surprised when I started playing with GPT and realized that everyone's looking at it in the general public as this thing you can go try to prove is, you know, a bot and run the test, the Turing test on and try to talk about tacos or whatever you can talk about to get it to, you know, and then I, and then I went to go use it as the business perspective. And I said, wow, this thing has legitimate business value right now today. And, and then the same thing with mid journey. So my instant reaction was fear, right? It's just like, okay, typically I feel fear. I'm like, okay, I feel fear when I don't understand something. So let's go understand it. <laughs> let's not be scared of it. Let's go understand it. And so uh, fear of understanding like how exactly everything would would roll out in the economy and all of that. After my little journey of a couple of weeks and inviting on some AI people and talking about it, I realized to your point uh, that it will take time to get into the marketplace and time for all that to happen. That being said, your explanation of how that unfolds is the highest quality, most articulate, best explanation I've ever heard. So that's, Josh, we want to make a clip well, thank of that. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You know, it, but what's really interesting, Joel, is you brought up a comment, and it, it's also really interesting, you know, DevOps delivering versus chat GPT delivering, or, or any of the other the AI pieces. A lot of the problems that happen with DevOps aren't because of the technology, they're because of the people. All right. And, and I'm not like faulting the, the people who are trying to live with what management just unloaded on them. But what management said would solve world peace and all this other stuff 
Like the worst thing I could ever hear is do DevOps. It's a good idea. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Back away at high speeds. Um, you've you've got to have a reason to do something. All right. And if you have a reason, okay, then we can create a system around making that happen. Channel, channeling my inner gold red and everything. You know, a system is a series of interrelated parts that need to have a goal. No goal, no system. Okay. You have to have something that you're trying to accomplish. So a lot of people who didn't get anything from DevOps is because they didn't go in with any objective in mind. All right. They just did it because it was a good idea. Now you go into any of these AI tools that are out there and you're like, okay, I want to do X. All right. You're going straight into a tool and it's cranking out something, right? You to machine and it's, it's giving you an output right there. It, it's, it's a little bit of an, a different thing. I totally agree. I'm blown away by AI. I do notice that some of the answers are formulaic. All right. Also, I asked him about who I was. You know, what do they call it? The, the thing where you always got to pump yourself up. So you put in your thing in the search tool or the whatever. And it was, it had some of it wrong. It had some of it right. But, um, you know, the, it, it's interesting because I'll just sum it up this way. DevOps has a huge people component to it. And that, of course, is the hardest part. Chat GPT and, and all these other generative AI tools have got these amazing technological capacities that they're bringing to bear that we're all, like me as a layperson, I look at them like, oh, that's so cool, all right? Because I love, I love graphics. I love music. I, I can't draw. I can't, I can't compose. But I love listening to these things. And look at some of the stuff this, these things crank out. It's just stunning. But you don't have that. You don't have that dependency on the human element as part of the deliverable to Joel to, to constrain you. So it, it, it is interesting, but it's always also interesting to look at and say, now, why is there a difference here? I don't know. Just, just some food for thought there. No, I like your ideas. I'm hungry, right? I like that food. Uh, you have a book. I want to give you a little shout out, right? You got a book, you got uh, an upcoming talk that you're giving with Gartner, if that's correct. Can you tell me what's the name of the book? What's it about? Where can I buy it? Oh, uh, the book is from a long time ago, The Phoenix Project. That was uh, Gene Kim, Kevin Wait. Bear, and myself. Are you kidding me? I yeah. have the Visible Ops Handbook. You were part of the Phoenix Project? I have Visible Dude. Ops Handbook. I have Phoenix Project. Um, and see, what happened was, you know, I got hired by Gartner, and they're like, well, do you have anything you need to declare? You know, kind of like going across the border. <laughs> yeah, I got this thing right here called The Phoenix Project. It's a fictional book. Oh, it's fiction? Yeah. We're not worried about fiction. Game on. All right, so we, we did the book, but then when uh, Gene and all the other folks went and did the other stuff, I had to kind of separate from them and, and focus on the, the Carter side of the house, if you will. But uh, yeah, no, that was me. That was one of the three there. Oh, that's crazy. Dude, that, that is so cool. I wasn't expecting that. I had prepped for the interview. That didn't come up. <laughs> and so, yeah, I have your book. Uh, it's on my bookshelf. It's notoriously for those who are listening. If you don't know what the Phoenix Project is, you should go buy the Phoenix Project on Amazon. And it is by far the most notable fiction book about software development, ops, and all that uh, that's ever been written. I'm sure, right? There's not a more popular book that's fiction on tech than for for, uh, yeah, for this I, category. I can't. I, can't speak I, I will to that. say on your behalf. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing was, we realized that if we put out another dry textbook, nobody would read it. But mm -hmm. if we created a story, you know, it, people would. And you know, that's exactly what Dr. Golrad did with the goal, which is what our book is patterned on. Golrad came up with this idea, and he had this body of knowledge that he'd been working on for a while called Theory of Constraints. And uh, he said, well, okay, maybe if I put it in a manufacturing setting, and make it kind of like a love story with a, you know, a guy who's like overworked and trying to get stuff done and all this stuff. Maybe, you know, that will work in, in terms of getting the story out there. So he approached this professional writer who thought it was the dumbest idea he'd ever heard, made Dr. <laughs> Goldratt pay him a flat fee up front to write it. Now that book is sold, you know, it's, I wouldn't surprise you at all if it's pushing 10 million copies. I, I got a copy of the goal some years ago. I was already at four or 5 million. And uh, let's see, years ago, how many years ago? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, it was a long time <laughs> ago, but every morning that, that that writer wakes up and goes, should have done the percent. Should have done, done the percent. percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so there's that. And then the 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 speaking portion of it. So since I'm a Gartner analyst, I'm always at Gartner events. So I'll be at the uh, Infrastructure Operations Cloud Strategy Summit this fall. Uh, my friend uh, Daniel Betts is uh, going to be the, the chair of the um, the event. I'll be in both London and also in our Las Vegas one and a whole bunch of my friends and colleagues because you, you get those when you're at a company for 13 years. And uh, we'd all love to talk to folks. Oh, nice. And how can people buy tickets for that? All right. Um, now, this is where George has to say George isn't 100% sure. Um, you see, we, we have the, these websites. So if you search like IOCS London or IOCS uh, Las Vegas, Gartner IOCS Las Vegas or IOCS London, it'll come up with the events. And now if you're a Gartner seat holder, you talk to your account team, they can help you figure out how to approach it and all that stuff. I was ready for everything, Joel, except now, how do we get a ticket? I do. How do we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just materialize at events here and there and just show up. I'm there. No, but uh, for those of you who are looking for something specifically, obviously the Google answer is great, but Josh will connect with their marketing team before this episode airs and <laughs> add the links to the description in the podcast. Awesome. You know, they'd really appreciate that. They're, the marketing people are going, oh, no, yes, George and Georgie answered. <laughs> I know. I, I see that one person in the audience. I'm like, uh oh, there's going to be edits later. <laughs> All right. So Visible Ops Handbook, that is, tell me a little bit about that book and why I'd want to buy it. Well, a long time ago in a a galaxy far, far away, there was this issue of how do we stabilize production? Because when you look at it, a lot of IT work is firefighting. You know, for folks familiar with IDLE, we're talking incident management where you have a deviation from standard production. And the problem is that firefighting eats you alive. All right. Because people aren't linear. Or, I'm sorry, they're not multitasking. They're, they're linear. We have to set up to work something. We're then executing. And then we get interrupted. Hey, George, it's a SEV1. All hands on deck. So you got to stop what you're working. That, that's a teardown cost. Now you got to set up to work the incident. People are yelling. They're screaming. All this stuff. Your train of thought just went right out the window. Now, you know, it's done. You tear down from the, the SEV1. You come back over. Except now you got to... You got to get your thoughts back together. You got to go, all right, what was I working on and why? And if you're like me, you're going to declare all your variables wrong after that. You know, but the the point is, you know, you, you've, you've lost your train of thought. Now, you know, incidents, incidents are just nasty. You know, when somebody says it was only five minutes, the negative impact was way more than five minutes. And for a lot of IT shops, you know, they, they don't have a lot of people. So if you want to get more productive, more productive work done, more productivity, uh, which you can think of as movement towards the goal, stuff that really matters, not just silly things like lines of code. Um, if you really want to improve productivity, one of the things you need to do is to reduce the waste, okay? Because it's eating up the the time, the bandwidth of your precious resources, your people. So in the Phoenix, Pro- I mean, Phoenix Project, in Visible Ops Handbook, what we were basically doing is saying, look, you know, 80% of incidents are caused by failed changes, now, that observation was originally uh, from Donna Scott, who was also with Gartner years and years ago before I joined Gartner. And uh, what we saw was true. A lot of the incidents are self-inflicted. You know, somebody made a change and then it blew everything up, usually right before they go on vacation or right before the weekend or, or whatever, right? And so then we'll have to all go into forensic firefighter mode trying to figure out what happened. And there's got to be a better way, Right. So Visible Ops was about saying, all right, look, what could you do to reduce this firefighting? Well, a lot of the stuff that you see in there eventually, you know, became some of the things that we talk about in DevOps, some of the things that we talk about in site reliability engineering. And I'm not saying that they they built on Visible Ops. I'm just saying the concepts parallel one another, okay? Because there's some tremendous bodies of knowledge out there. But the idea is, okay, number one, why don't we have people talk to one another so that you build stuff that's going to operate the way that you need it to operate? Um, At the start of an incident, why don't we ask the question, what changed? If we know that the majority of incidents are caused by failed changes, then we should be be asking right up front what changed, which means we need to have the change-related information right in front of us. Now, for you and I, you know, like our discussion earlier, okay, I want to be using machine learning to be running herd on all the stuff I'm doing with monitoring and telemetry, all right? I want to look for something that's going on, that's anomalous behavior. Then what I should be doing is saying, okay, 
I've got 5,000 alerts. All of them are using this load balancer. I'm then diving into the load balancer. I'm grabbing the change-related information on the load balancer, whatever, and then I'm presenting it in front of somebody instead of then Joel having to say, oh, look, 5,000 alerts. Oh, my God. Um, instead, you know, you're able to dive right in it and your, your mean time to restore improves dramatically. So visible ops is really about improving stability, improving reliability. And even then, when we were finishing it, Gene, Kevin, and I are like, you know, this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And then after many, many, you know, hey, let's start, let's stop, let's start, let's stop, we eventually did the Phoenix project. So visible ops is still very timely for folks who are wanting to stabilize their production environment. It's just a little dated in terms of stuff like we say, oh, bare metal bills. And now people are like, what's he talking about? Oh, can you like build a, a environment from scratch in, in the cloud, you know, programmatically? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, they just take it as a given. But at the time, you know, it's like, wow, well, okay, you know, bare metal build from tape. Oh boy, that'd be cool. You know, it's just, so there's a few little comments in there like that where it's showing its age, but it's good for folks who are looking to stabilize. But I would very quickly take uh, visible ops and and treat that as food for thought. And then also look at concepts from Google Site Reliability Engineering, which I think is so cool. Yeah, we actually had some conversations near near that with Tony, a guy named Tony. I think it was Tony from Broadcom. Josh he lives over in Memphis. Tony Davis, Broadcom. He, and he was talking about meaningful observability, which it was like the extent of all of that industry in those years. And I thought I thought that was pretty interesting. But what's your next book going to be? Is there is there a book coming out? Um. Well. A lot of our stuff now happens on um, happens within Gartner. So I will do these little white papers with with colleagues. So like um, last year, myself, uh, Roger Williams, Daniel Betts, Hassan in a, in a city, uh, we got together and we said, okay, I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. Um, how do we introduce agile concepts into infrastructure operations? So we did a little, you know, uh, research note that linked to a PDF that that talked about that, you know, which a, a Gartner client could get hold of. What we're working on right now is uh, taking the same people and setting that happened in that first story and int introducing some of the concepts of platform engineering into that. So we're, we're just kind of extending there. So right now, you know, as long as I'm in the Gartner family, I have no plan on, on making any changes. My stuff's happening within Gartner. Cool. Well, we did it, George. We made a podcast. How do you feel? Hey, I feel great, man. And you didn't hang up on me. That's always a plus. No, you know, if I'm not escorted off a of property, it's always a good sign. That's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good day. Absolutely. <laughs>